And just in case we recorded also on Zoom, just in case mm -hmm. something broke up. Or... Sure. Okay. Let's get started. Yes. Yep. Okay. Hello, everyone. Oh, okay. Start recording now. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another talk hosted by the Coventry University Architecture Society. Fashtelier is a collective which aims to create architecture that embraces the evolution of open infrastructures and visualizes it in a way that can be perceived in multiple angles, meanings, and uses. Their work challenges the traditional way of approaching design by collaboration with multiple disciplines, backgrounds, and interests to create innovative ideas for urban development. You may know them from their amazing entries for various competitions, including the Rome Poetry Hall competition, which required contestants to design a multi-purpose concrete hall in Rome, and their latest work, proposing a reuse strategy to be implemented on Spain's incomplete infrastructure after the 2009 economic recession. So without further ado, I would like to invite today's guests to speak and introduce themselves. Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Hida Haida, for the presentation and introduction. And thank you, Alexander, for all the coordination. Uh, yesterday, me and Michele, um, founder members of Fat Atelier, we're going to present our research and our sort of like a, a retrospective manifest of our project from the very beginning and the, the latest ones. So I think we can start. Uh, let me just share the screen. Okay. We see nice. So hello everyone, I'm Michele Fumagalli. And yes, we are part of FAT Atelier. So in order to present our, uh, our work, of designers, we started from uh, a question, who is the designer today? So um, nowadays, the line between designers and users is thinner and thinner, uh, in the sense that uh, here you have some example. Uh, this is the Torre David, David Tower in Caracas, which was uh, an abandoned um, tower which has been occupied and got appropriate during time. And it's uh, very clear how the users themselves became the designers, conscious or not. Uh, yeah, another, another famous example of this kind of overlapping uh, roles between designers and and users is the Quinta Monroy in Mexico from Elemental. But uh, today, today technology is, I mean, this kind of dynamics of overlapping designers and users are more and more common today uh, also because of technology. So as you see, like it's very easy from a bedroom to become a, a, a cinema or, or an office, from a beach to become a working pe uh, place or from a train. Mm. At the same time, we live in a society that is very, very, very diverse and uh, multicultural and uh, I mean, compared to, to the one of um, few decades ago, we, we are a multitude that has really different tastes, uh, wishes, um, needs. And so therefore, uh, we started thinking what kind of architecture can address this kind of uh, different needs, different uh, wishes, different tastes. We thought about generic space. What's a, what is in our sense a generic space? Uh, these are a couple of, um, of, um, of example. You have the Tama, Tama Art University in Tokyo from Toyo Ito, 
or the Rolex Center uh, from Sana in Lausanne. And uh, as you can see, or when you go there, like uh, here the line between designers and users is really, really thin in the sense that use are, uh, uses are uh, suggested, but then uh, you can find like people and students uh, doing uh, different stuff in the same place, in the same way they can, you can see them in the same space, uh, uh, eating, studying, sleeping even. So another example is the Teatro Continuo in Milan uh, from, uh, from Burri. It's in the Sempione Park. It's a very interesting uh, architecture in the sense that it's, a, it's an open architecture in the middle of the park, which uh, is, is used to both to, to, to host like public events, like uh, uh, theater representation, but also like people just playing on it or uh, like the, 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 the worker of the, of the area get their, their uh, break lunch, lunch break. Uh, in a day-to-day day -day life. And uh, so we started thinking, uh, what's, what are the features of this kind of generic architecture? We, we thought, I mean, our focus was to like to identify these features. Uh, we started analyzing them all over, the, the one we, we found them. And one of them for sure is inclusivity in the sense uh, of the, the, the ability to include, to include different uses like the, the mask of Lina Bobardi in Sao Paulo. Uh, it creates a huge cover square uh, where uh, all different uses are allowed. Uh, and uh, yeah, another uh, features that, um, that for us is uh, relevant in, in these cases is to provide an open infrastructure or a flexible infrastructure. I mean, very famous example is the Fun Palace from Cedric Price. That was a structure uh, thought to be reassembled uh, in different configuration according to the needs. So it was like, the, yeah, what's the, the most flexible thing you, you can even, think about it. And another features is the resiliency in the sense that uh, the ability of the manufacture of the, of the building of the infrastructure to survive to its own, uh, um, to its own um, program that was designed for. So for example, here in uh, Shibuya, Tokyo, uh, you have the uh, spore bridge that was, I mean, was not meant, not designed to be a sport facility, but with time became one of it. Another example can be the, the um, Palazzo della Ragione in Padua. It has this really generous and amazing sala uh, from the 12th century that uh, during the time was used uh, in very, very, very different uh, uses, like from the, from the market uh, for, to like uh, um, a deposit of the, of the weapons or whatever. But, and in our opinion, that was, uh, the reason was to the iconic, uh, um, iconic aspect, I mean, was, was used in different ways, but always keeping uh, its, um, its uh, architectonical uh, aspect, let's say. So uh, for this reason, we are interested in this kind of spaces because, uh, because uh, Many of them, I mean, it's, it's our interpretation of some spaces. Of course, they were not designed uh, thought to be generic spaces, 
but uh, we are interested in them because it's there that uh, the evolutive and, and, and process and the transformation take place. And it, from, from both, from the urban point of view, so uh, transformation of the city, but uh, together with the society. So I think we have some project now. Andre. Miki, can I ask you to share the screen because I have a problem with mine. Do you have the presentation? Yes. Apologies to everybody, one second. Just a sec. Here you go. You can start with Roma if you want, actually. So I can, I can actually start um, a little bit talking about this project. So this is basically was the first project we we were asked to to work uh, as a, the real project we did all the three of us all together. Um, Yes, exactly. So the, the, the main, the main uh, um, challenge um, was to create a hall for the city, for the city of Rome, that is a city that is pretty uh, densified, it's pretty dense, uh, and has a lot of, uh, uh, as you can see, like uh, um, urban challenge, urban traffic challenge. So um, they wanted to create a sort of a retreat yeah. moment um, and we um, imagine immediately that we didn't want to create anything that was um, augmenting the density of the city. So therefore we decided to work with the void. We worked with the void uh, and Fatez in the plaza, the plaza above. Uh, on the other hand, what we don't wanted to do is to waste any uh, moment, uh, any materials, and so we imagine what we can avoid to create a lot of uh, waste uh, that automatically are generated by uh, the construction site. Um, and interpreting a little bit the concept of spolia of the Romans, where you actually try to utilize all the elements, we decide to uh, use the soil itself to cast the space. So uh, in that sense, we just, as you can see in this image, we just like slowly try to dig and to determine the shape uh, by um, accepting that the shape would be a consequence of the technical, te constructive and technological process of the, of, the, of the process. So as you can see, we start uh, removing part of the soil, we cover with a layer of material and then we pour the concrete. And therefore we start digging the hurt and this negative space that we generate, then that, at that point, this would have been the, the space. As you can see, these are some maquettes that we did back in the days where we were testing a bit the quality of the, of the materiality. And here is the main dome. The main dome, as you can see, have three main uh, structural elements and all the services are uh, allocated in the peripheral peripheral area. As Michele was saying, um, here there is two main, uh, I think, level of uh, architecture. There's one that is special, it is one that is more primordial. That is this idea of uh, this big dome that somehow connects with the scale of some public moments of the road city of Rome in his history and, and during his evolution. And then there is this uh, the first revelation in our, uh, let's say, really uh, primary, primordial um, interest in to create a space that can have multiple function at the same time. Because as we say before, if we guarantee 
the design of a space that is not specific to a function or is not designed for a function and somehow is good enough and attractive enough and quality enough to be inhabited. That's why we think that is a key to have some space that the city will recognize as a reference, as in Palazzo La Ragione, for example. In fact, as you can see provocatively, we imagine two different, uh, three or several different uh, uh, scenarios. One could be a term, why not? If you can fill it with water, this becomes a pool. But if you take out the water, this could be a space where people uh, spontaneously they will go there to play, to read a book, or to spend their time with their friends. In the same way, this is another project we did along the years, uh, straight after actually. Uh, and we were saying before, um, when we were talking with the, with the organizer of this conference, uh, one of our characteristics of our office is to create a network of collaborations. Uh, and this project is also made with some friends of us, uh, architects uh, in Portugal. And uh, we were participating to this competition in Paris, which is in Champ de Mar, that is uh, in front of uh, uh, Trocadero, in front of La Tour Eiffel. And they were asking to design a pavilion uh, that somehow was a, a place where all different type of people were uh, could be joined together. Because this is, was straight after the terrorist attack in Paris in the 2010, um, in that period. So somehow the city needed to have like a strong uh, answer. Here in this image, you can see, uh, this is one of the, our, uh, just a quick introduction regarding this. It's our, um, one of our way, let's say method of working, where we have something that we call allegory, that uh, we start with this image at the beginning and we somehow try to condense in uh, one paper uh, all the objectives, all the reference, everything that we care. And this is an exercise that we learned in Lisbon when we were studying with our professor Francisco Arismoteus that was asking us to summarize somehow any idea in within one image at the beginning of the process. I think it's something that really helped us because we keep changing it. We keep adding layers. We keep adding references. We take out references till at the end of the process, this image, it's already the project. If you go to the next page, we can see, um, again, this is, was the base of the, of the interest we had in this project. Um, we wanted to create a space that somehow is timeless as much as we can. Timeless as the, the place where it's located, right? You, on the right side, you see the plan of the Expo in the 19th century in Paris, where the Tour Eiffel was conceived. And on the left, you see how today's nowadays is from the map and uh, then our pavilion that somehow is creating a sort of a dialogue and a reference with the steel architecture of that, that era. Therefore, imagine that we wanted to create a space that has no hierarchy, that is generated by one element. And the grid that we generate with this element could be inhabited as we want. So as you can see, this is a bit a classic drawing because you have a sort of a particle around, but then the sequence as a space is, this, is no hierarchic, right? The ticketing, the bathroom are bubbles within this uh, sort of a grid that is more solid in the ground floor, let's say, and then the elements that generates it uh, becomes a pillar. So we wanted also to create this sort of um, transition into dimensional where the space is also vertically somehow were divided, were suggested as di divided, but then somehow you would have a really strong uh, visual permeability in order to create a really inclusive space. This is a maquette, this is some studies we did back in the days, as you can see, this comes before than the plan. And as you can see, but here the genesis of the project was already clear. And we were working not just on the order, because at the end we decided that the, it was not important to have an order in this project, but it was important to define this sort of in, 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 interactions between the space. If you go next page, and here you can see a little bit what I was saying. Everything is generated by the same element, structure-wise as well. 
So we imagine a pillar, a wall that becomes a pillar, and we somehow also managed to design the structure that was holding everything together with the repetition of this element as a truss, trusses for the roof. So this is, again, this is the dialogue that I was describing before. Um, we didn't want to create a, a formal um, relationship between the, the silhouette of the tower and the pillar. The pillar is a reference uh, by itself. The pillar is born, is conceived as a reinterpretation of the steel architecture. So something easy, something that is, um, let's say, assemblable, and the, the repetition of the element can generate something wider. And here, this is uh, in, in sequence of time, actually, this, this project are all uh, uh, consecutives. And we, this also was one, one of the projects which challenged us the most, uh, because it was the first time in this case, it opens our, one of our main reflections or main interests that is try to understand how architecture can deal with more concrete phenomena, more concrete phenomena that happens every day, that are characterizing our society, that are defining the, the, the destiny of our society. In this case, this is an allegory itself and is representing in a layering of knowledge, let's say, or like layering of meanings, uh, what is the project and the way we are trying to um, deal with it. It, it. The project is a provocation is a provocation on an economical condition, if you go to the next page, of what's happening in, uh, what was happening in Spain uh, after the, the economical crisis, um, the, the country decided to uh, keep investing in the, in the new uh, urban, urban uh, uh, development. But at a certain point, the funds, they determinated, and therefore only the infrastructure stayed as a, as a witness of a failed system. The competition was uh, held and organized by the Biennale of Venezia in that specific year by Iñaki Carnicero, that is a really talented architect that inspired us a lot. Um, and they were asking how we could have reactivated these spaces. So as you can, you can see in the first image in the allegory, we, uh, uh, and as I was saying before, we didn't want to give a really formal answer to this project. And we decided to imagine a, let's say, a nomadic architectural solution, where we imagine as a reference by John Aiduk in Mask of Medusa, that he has this, uh, architectural figures that are traveling the world and they make something happen, they change the condition of the space where they interact. Uh, and then they left and somehow they, they leave behind them a change. We wanted to create some architectural devices, easy to be assembled, that there are, they were the basis of uh, inhabiting. So we have the kitchen, we have the space to the cult to pray, we have the stage. The stage is a, is a place where you share knowledge. You are the trade economics for economics, right? Somehow you need to generate a way to sustain yourself or to uh, deal whatever uh, is needed. And then the shelter. And we hypothesized that as for John Iduk, this would have happened as a, a theater act. So in the first, uh, the, the masks and the caravan of masks, the riches, the unfinished, the unfinished in this case, the generic unfinished is a roundabout. And as you were saying at the beginning in the reference that we share with Michele, this it's something that after in time, we, we realized that it was uh, already a strong condition of a human being to use and abandon spaces and to use it for, for something bad. And as the caravan of masks reaches the, the then finish the public joint 
the public joined in that sense in that moment of of the competition we imagine that this could have been a space for uh people that actually they needed a space to live that somehow the society was not really inclusive and it was not really easy for them to find one and once it got inhabited somehow the frame of the performance in this case like the frame is this sort of a mask this sort of like a wood structure and be underneath this wood structure the inhabitants they would have developed their own spaces and the mask if you go to the next page would have been transformed in something else at this point uh, the structure got adapt, adapted to a new or the infrastructure to a new settings to a new way to live and the devices this pop-up architecture this nomadic architecture they leave the place and they will move to another infrastructure that needs to be inhabited you can continue here Yeah, here it's a summary somehow of, of this uh, frame of performance where this is a moment of the performance now when there is this sort of inhabiting an unfinished structure and customize it as you need. And talking about uh, this uh, per not per permanence, uh, this uh, nomadic uh, a temporality in architecture. Uh, we decided to, to continue this research for another project in Portugal, in Rabasal, that is in the Alentejo, this is a central part of Portugal, where we were asked to uh, cover uh, a ruin, a Roman ruin that uh, is under excavation since 80 years and is still under excavations. Uh, what we imagine is that uh, we didn't want to stop the layering of the transformation of the place of the architecture and therefore imagine to have the inflatable structure that uh, as needed was moving here and there and moving to location to ruin by ruin and not just and maybe move, moving nearby the ruin and creating something uh inclusive something for the collectivity so just using this opportunity to uh, create something else than the function specific that was asked and as you can see here, this is the actual conditions where they mount this uh, wood structure uh, locally from left to right, right to left, but somehow is missing this sort of uh, unitarian strategy. And again, we didn't want to, we were scared that if we would have had one layer more, we would have stopped somehow this process of discovery that uh, this place still have, because as I was saying, it's not yet finished, the archaeological a process and I, for us should not never finish somehow right if it was not clear like architecture is always need to transform if you want to survive so here we can see an overview of the scale of the process project uh, there is a lot of um like from four three five six to eleven these are all different uh, type of ruins the most uh, let's say formal is uh, Pars Urbana that is the five and six, but going towards the north of the side is really rural. It's extremely wild, and all that part is under under excavations. As I was saying, we uh, activated activated a really light uh, and subtle uh, strategy where we decided to use the pebbles of the calcareous that uh, are discovered on the site. Of course, they're not part of the ruins, but it's part of the excavation process to create a sort of a layer of path that it could be easily removed. It could be easily moved and suggest the space of the shelter, let's say, for uh, whatever uh, activity needs to happen nearby, in front or above the or inside the ruins with this inflatable uh, ATFE uh, structure. So this was a, a scenario here 
in axonometry explaining a little bit how this works. Um, in general, what I think is interesting is that somehow we are not uh, changing or conflicting with uh, with existing. It's uh, the, the this inflatable roof is held on the ground is uh, by small concrete blocks and a, a cable. These concrete blocks are 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter. They're denser. There is few of them that can be moved and they can be removed. So it's really easy to be displayed. And here in a few suggestion of how this actually could work. Of course, we were required to um, somehow uh, provide some fixed functions and we decide to use the basis is a grid. So we take advantage of the grid and we uh, also inhabit this, this structural grid in small parts with the same materials, with some curtains, really something extremely light to um, display whatever function at the moment will, will be needed. In this case, they wanted to display some uh, art belonging to the ruin itself, but also we suggested the possibility, as I was saying at the beginning, to contaminate this monofunctional uh, program with some different ideas. So we, why not taking some contemporary art and then somehow the ruins also economically will, in some parts, let's say, without being uh, ruined or with damage, uh, could live, could have more benefit, could be more open than just uh, a memorial place, let's say. And here we are moving and translating towards the north part, as I was saying, this is the last uh, dealt with, is the last, uh, let's say, is still ongoing. And here, for example, we, as I was saying before, we, we propose to have a library for the community. Rabasal is a really small village that doesn't have a lot of services, doesn't have a lot of public spaces. So we somehow wanted to drag people to move from their everyday life to here. And this is in the last, this is, the north north part where is still everything is to be discovered and this would just protect the workers in here this is a project for buritis in uh, belo horizonte in brazil in brazil and here we were uh, asked again to deal with the a side effect of the economical process especially for real estate and uh, we uh, basically we wanted to celebrate this condition rather than to have, let's say uh, avoided it or to disguise it we wanted to take advantage of something that was not considered valuable as you can see here this is what it is brazil as you all know they had a really huge uh, economic boom and growth at certain points of the, 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 the after the war uh, and and continuing here for some several years. Um, so the urban sprawl was really severe, and uh, the severe real estate also take advantage of a lot of conditions of the legislation, etc., etc. And they start to building, as you can see here, really densely, really highly. And uh, this, when they finish the usable land, the formal land, they start building on the cliff. And when you build on the cliff, you need to create stilts. But that part, for a lot of reasons, because on the, let's say, mountain side is blind, it was not considered valuable. So since it's not considered valuable, it got abandoned and it creates a urban typology. If you go to this place, you have three urban main typologies. You can see here, you have the favela, that is a necessity for the density of the people that cannot afford a better uh, uh, dwelling. And you have these stills that is in between these two reality. And then on the top of the model, on top of the hill, you have the luxury apartments. As you can see, this is the condition, right? So the north part is extremely difficult, but we found it really beautiful. We found it really, uh, somehow this was already, this is the fan palace, no? So we said, why don't we make something out of it? Not just uh, architectural wise, but how can we make this uh, working as a, an economical activator? How can we use something that uh, the market itself refused? 
So what we decide is that this is dominating and is dominating, is dominating, let's say, condition is a privilege. It's something that a lot of other architecture they don't have, especially overlooking the economical market of the bigger city, but also the favela itself. So we intend it as a vitrine, but a vitrine for everybody because the project was really tight with the budget. They have just $5,000 and we need to build something with that money. So the first um, idea was to, of course, to inhabit part of it because we could not inhabit everything, but we wanted to give something uh, for, for everybody, for everybody that uh, needed a space to establish their uh, activity and for everybody that wanted to go there to express themselves. You want to play, you want to paint, you want to uh, have a bar, you want to have everything. And you also have the possibility to take advantage of it. Everybody will look at you. This is another configuration of the system. This is really first concept. This is a beautiful painter by a famous uh, Brazilian architect that is uh, portraying this, uh, the layering, the topical layering of, of Brazil. And of course the drawings is, is our book. So as I was saying, what we decided is we have money just to inhabit with one constructing process and one in one location. We decided to use scaffoldings to rent scaffoldings because it was either maybe challenging for us to afford to build for safety reasons, hoping that the economic system somehow would have uh, been successful uh, in a small scale. And uh, this structure could have been by, by the community and then expanded if successful. And then we just, uh, we were just able to occupy the, the facade, but the facade somehow was having all the quality we needed to continue our project. Here, we had just one moment where we allow ourselves to expand over the facade is, uh, as you can see, there is the, the topography line where we had this contact with the, with the, the hill. We really like this idea that uh, somehow again here the element that you know, the, the hill itself, there was a possibility for us to deal with in the most public moment. Of course, beside the, 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 the steel parts, the steel components of the scaffolding technology, we also take advantage of the, of the curtains that the scaffolding has. Every, everybody, you know, especially for example in Japan, it's really interesting. Sometimes the architecture under construction are more, more beautiful. The architecture they're gonna be built with this all the curtains that the, the, the scaffolding system has. So we try also to work with that. Of course, it's a really spontaneous way to design it. Uh, we needed and we knew that people uh, needs to be sheltered, needs to be also not all the time visible, but somehow we create a filter. And as you can see here, we imagine the, the most based uh, usage and functions. There is a painter, there is a cabellerero in Portuguese, it means uh, hairdressers, there is a, a band, there is uh, uh, some others, uh, local uh, realities. Artist, as you can see here, and also is a way to gather the community. Uh, due to this position, as we were saying, this place was not neither belonging to the lower part of the city, neither to the higher part, but somehow we thought that this is generic uh, quality, generic quality that we found really important in architecture as, as we are trying to explain, could have also merged two different uh, society layers in this project. So <clears throat> this project uh, was uh, in Munich. 
was uh, developed for uh, a competition held, held by the public housing company of the city. And uh, in the competition was uh, required to investigate different development uh, models compared to the traditional ones. So um, Munich had a, let's say, a dramatic situation, but not that, uh, that rare in Europe, because the need of economic housing that satisfies different needs um, what, what is really urgent. And the, um, the housing price in Munich is always higher and you know, not accessible, actually. And this has nothing to do with the, the construction system or the, the cost of the materials, but uh, it has to do with the unstoppable increase in the land prices of the plots as it's happening in all the major cities in, in Europe. Um, our project uh, involves a, the creation of a generic double height structure that uh, effectively multiplies the space of the plot of, uh, and, and so therefore of the land. Uh, this structure um, provides the main facility needed for a building uh, such as uh, stairs, uh, all the 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 the, um, the water, the the gas, which is not needed anymore, the electricity and whatever, and um, it and it will and the structure itself will uh, will not be for sale but only rentable. This with the with the purpose of excluding exactly of excluding the 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 price of the land from the speculation mm. it's okay we thought about we did we did this comic thinking about a way how to uh, like the, the the people interested mm, the interested user will be able to build their homes uh, according to the to their needs by renting uh, the plot of the land, uh, not buying it, and and the idea is to have like these double heights and this really generous structure because the idea is to include any type of program. Um, so from from sport facilities to housing, of course, different type of housing to offices, whatever. Um, being flexible and adapting to changes in use over the time. Ah, so this project was um, was made uh, in Milan uh, for uh, the development of a former logistic plot, uh, very, quite large. Um, from from an urban point of view, so the plot is is this one. The, the from an urban point of view was the was the opportunity for us to relink uh, two different areas, uh, which uh, um, present a very fragmented morphology. So bringing them to, together could be an advantage for both. Um, so the public space is organized by a central building, the mobility hub, um, which uh, beyond providing, okay, of course, mobility hub, because it provides uh, the exchanges needed between different ways of mobility, such as uh, car, bicycles, and whatever. Um, and it also connect the two area, the, the, the two different side of, of the rails through a, an elevated bridge. And it also creates a, a piazza uh, that hosts different collective and commercial functions. So this is the, the square created, but uh, from, the, from, from the local point of view, uh, the concept was, it was a housing uh, competition. So the concept uh, and the goal for us 
was to offer more space for a less price. How we thought about common areas, collective spaces. Collective spaces are a resource and an opportunity for the life of a building. The limit, however, is often represented by the location of them on the ground floor uh, or, or sometimes on the roof, but um, which, I mean, makes them not really relevant and not very influential, influential towards apartments. I mean, I think we all know some buildings with very promising collective spaces that never have been used actually. So our intent was to reverse this dynamic through a light and flexible structure, which uh, extending in height, provide all the apartments uh, a direct access to the common space, modifying and directly influencing the housing types. Uh, The structure on the side of the building is uh, accessible from each apartment. This is the structure. And uh, it is an extra. Uh, in which sense? First of all, it's built with the light and cheap materials and is not isolated. Therefore, it, doesn't, it, it, it does not count for SL, which is superficial order which is the parameter uh, with the, the municipality of the city of Milan uh, used, to, um, used to establish the, um, the volumetry allowed. Uh, therefore, uh, not being part of this SL, it doesn't compete with the square meters usable for housing and uh, it will remain excluded from the logic of speculation of the market, let's say. And yeah, so here you see, like we thought this structure uh, is as a very cheap and very uh, light structure made up of wooden pillars and wooden slabs uh, that lean against the, the, the building actually all the, 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 the inner side of the, of the courtyard. And, and, um, and um, sorry. And um, yes, it's it's a it's a very um, cheap and and um, and light structure. Uh, with uh, on the facade there are sliding translucent polycarbonate panels that open and close as needed. So the idea of this structure is to be very flexible and to be um, that can be um, augmented and, or or um, or not. Uh, giving different configuration to the apartment itself. So for example, here you have a configuration where all the apartments have their own, um, let's say, uh, part of the structure and they, they are using it uh, like individually, uh, but can be also like the two apartments bring them together in order to have a more uh, generous, uh, um, space to use or you can also think that uh, some of them um, um, can even be rented to the neighboring apartments becoming a small source of income when it is considered appropriate from the users so here are the different configuration the idea is to have these panels which are removable and uh, and they can change the space according to the needs. And to close, guys, we have last two projects. Uh, this is really recent, uh, together with Milano. One, um, and somehow is is in a different location, different market. Um, 
di different uh, um, somehow of course <laughs> urban pattern urban settlement um, but somehow they have something similar they, they share a similar strategy um, and, and research this competition was, was made now in Japan in uh, Tokyo in the north uh, part of the, of the sprawl of the, the city in Akabane Danchi the, the question is, what is a danchi? Danchi, it's uh, um, so, social housing uh, that the Japanese government uh, is a massive pro program of social housing. The Japanese government launched after the big boom of economic uh, after the Second World War. Um, and it was highly mass uh, produced and sponsored. Um, as you can see uh, here. Um, the interesting thing is um, the dream and ambition was to create something that was somehow providing all the services for the new uh, type of society, this rising new type of society that is the middle class in Japan, that is somehow in a different way linked to the capsules uh, of uh, metabolism. Uh, in this case here, if you go back one, one, one page, uh, the, the Danish is inspired by a Soviet uh, model, but with the flexibility of the interior space of Japan. So it's, it's, it's strictly and more, greatly fascinating to see uh, this tradition, a sense of tradition, a need of tradition associated to a more global uh, housing prototype. Unfortunately, in, after the 70s, where the population of Japan starts to, uh, decreasing, the danchi they become obsolete. The market becomes more uh, severe, more strong, uh, more so savage somehow also. And then the public housing uh, it, it was dead. Uh, there's no public housing anymore in Japan. The land is too valuable, as you know. And all the program of danchi, it's uh, taken by this... Uh, private organization called UR, a urban renaissance that aims to create a new typology of living. And, uh, but although the, the, the Danchi idea uh, has a lot of problem, the Danchi is not anymore fancy, it's not anymore appealing. Mm, there is no service anymore. As you can see here, it's really difficult to live there. There is uh, not a lot of interaction, mostly, it's affordable just for one sector of the population. What you are asking this competition, specifically in this complex, is to rethink, uh, reimagine a new way to uh, design or refurbish this star house. Star house, because as you can see in the plan, it's, uh, it looks like a star. There is a few prototypes of this uh, urban typology in the area, three actually, but it was a revolution at the time because of the way the planning was made. Japan um, always as a tradition, that's why I showed you the, the image before, um, as a really beautiful uh, architectural typology in, in living. That is, the space are fluid. The kitchen is a space where you live, you move a wall and then become something else. You fold your, your uh, foot on and then you use the space. Somehow in this uh, plan of the housing, they created two DK, so they have kitchen and rooms. So for the first time in the your typology of housing, they separate these moments. So in that time, it was really successful. Somehow uh, not enough, not strong enough to keep the, the traction of the star house. I will be really quick in the explanation, this is a, a project I did with some good friends of mine in this idea of the network that we, we a collaboration that we want, we are establishing, we want to establish. Uh, our ambition in this is to bring diversity, is to bring services, is to bring more function that they don't exist there. It's not just the sake to be green. Uh, we wanted to bring um, and to gen that this new diversity that we somehow we were able to bring would have somehow br bring new dwellers, new inhabitants, like people from the city center, people from lower uh, layers of society, not just still the middle class that is populated in the How we do it? We have two strategies. 
we were asked to we make a structural uh, uh, refurbishment. Uh, we secured the building from uh, we upgrade the seismical uh, uh, structure using uh, cables so the building somehow it's held on the ground and the structure is really flexible and then we add a really small addition the small addition is the one that we were aiming to use and sell and rent and to create new typology of interaction new functions as a free occupation the image you saw at the beginning it's uh, Yagura, it's uh, the reference of, for that typology, and it's uh, the temporary wood structure that uh, is built during the festivity in Japan. So it's somehow linked to the memory of something that is uh, used temporarily, creates something and then goes away. So this is the star house, of course, doing, you can see on the, on the facade, we extend a little bit. We have this wood structure that is somehow uh, hanged on the ground with these carbon fibers. We take advantage of the roof of the building uh, that now is more stable, more secure to have a, this sort of more playground uh, functions. And you can see this circle building. It's the one that is gonna, we imagine it could have host more functions. These are uh, a way of different configuration. We imagine the space itself, because of course we had to deal with the uh, rehabilitation itself of the building, but this is like more deeper. And we, we just find a way to connect the three apartments together, because if we bring diversity of you know, dwellers, they also want to expand and they want to expand their uh, provision prediction of living in the space right and this is also one of the problem of the dunch you stay there for two years three years because you have a contract then you go away so somehow there is no um, a lot of uh, interesting transformation happening in long term and again here sort of a summarization of how the spaces could be changed again on the right side we provide a lot of uh, really japanese typology such as the center, the center is a public bath for women and, and men separated. So the first two floor, we, the, of course, this is a suggestion, but uh, we want to give it a suggestion that everybody could have understand somehow, uh, should have been somehow attractive. And then of course, post facilities, public spaces, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the last project that we presented today. We are a bit, uh, uh, no, we're a bit tight with the time, uh, but this is important for us to share with you. Um, this is a bit for us, I think it's um, the, the most challenging and difficult project we did. Uh, we did it with not uh, at all a speculative intention, but somehow to try to bring a bit of um, support for what uh, tragically happened uh, one year ago and during August um where the port of beirut the harbor the storage exploded and as we all know uh the consequences consequences that it creates the the aim is to imagine a way that area could be as fast as possible uh, be given back to the to the people of Beirut. Um, this is the plan of Beirut. Beirut have really big uh, green lungs, has really dense urban pattern, and I have a really beautiful diversity of people and uh, history, uh, culture, and the harbor somehow it's linking all this diversity from east to west. Again, what we, our aim was, uh, now is, is easier to explain. Of course, it was uh, challenging to reach this place in this project. We collaborate to uh, some colleagues of us, uh, uh, Yasmin Zahan, Zalan, especially, 
uh, that was really um, important for in the in the brainstorming and to uh, try to understand the city. Um, what it's it's was clear for us at a certain point is the, the city of Beirut. It's really diverse and is a great quality, but is really fragmented, and it's really difficult to access a lot of services. Is a city that has really strong political power, had a really strong economic system that is really not inclusive. There's a lot of gentrification, and all the area of the port is controlled by few people and few uh, entities. In general, the first big uh, topic that we wanted to raise through the sequence of research that proposed at the same time the problem and the solution or the aim of the solution through the area of the port is the public space. Public space is really controlled, it's fully controlled. There is not a lot of green areas or usable green areas. Each public space in Beirut is controlled, it's difficult to uh, be inhabit. So we hoped that we could have increased this condition if we would have uh, uh, somehow uh, tried to find a way to give a piece of each piece of land to the to the harbor to uh, the diverse component inhabiting of the city all of them from the real estate uh, stakeholders to the people from Carantina that is the north uh, east part of the of the city here is a little bit of accessibility also we want to solve it the problem of the traffic as we know Oh, please, please. But mostly we wanted to guarantee, as what I was saying before, this diversity, diversity of uh, sharing, sharing economy through a really big land. So we try to map which are the land value in Beirut, as you can see. Darker blue is the higher in this Beirut central district. And so somehow we aim that uh, also doing in, in, in the new, in the area of the harbor, uh, we could have replicated this diversity in not hierarch hierarchical way. In the same way we did it for the income that they goes together, right? And we also did a sort of a collage city uh, trying to understand which type of urban patterns that could be mixed together in order not to forget everybody, but to try to represent the beauty of the diversity of the of the city of Beirut. So the first act we did is like we divided in platforms, extending the main axis, and divided in platforms helped this extension of the city naturally somehow to meet the sea. The second layer of this uh, proposal it's to increase the green network as a, a sustainable, uh, let's say, uh, landscape strategy, mm -hmm. a sustainable uh, uh, connection strategy, a mobility strategy along this green belt, we will have had also, we will have had um, a tram line, electrical, and we wanted to completely have an area that is uh, tra uh, traffic free. Uh, one of the other problems of Beirut is, uh, is really hardly congestionated by, by cars. So in also like in the project of Milano, we imagine a series of mobility hub in the nodal points to leave your car and then you start using either by walk or either like new bicycles and, and electrical transportations. Of course, we need to think also how to organize the port. So we shuffle it a bit, we reduce the footprint and we reorganize it as much as we could. Part of it could be relocated. Of course, it's a really important economical part of the city, but somehow we wanted also to merge some of the storage area with the urban pattern and the green pattern. And this is our, con let's say, uh, as I was saying before, we, we wanted to reassume uh, the typology of the city uh, within the grid. So we decided to divide the block in a matrix, a bit like uh, inspired by Serda somehow. Is a matrix, it's easier to deal with the matrix itself and then the network of the matrix will do the, we will create all the, the network of the, of the area and then somehow hopefully 
this way that we we imagine this network of matrix will uh, blend with the CT on the back. So in each um, matrix, we imagine to reassume the typology, the most uh, recurrent typology of the city, that is the, the skyscrapers, the condominium, and the solo houses. The grid itself proposed in the way also we, we intend it to have like a more diverse, a more right division of the balance between land, the value of the house and the dwellers itself. So we propose to mix. It's not necessarily the people that have more money they need to stay all in the tower, but we also try to within the blocks itself to have a sort of economical equilibrium where we can provide diversity. And this it could be uh, an hypothesis of how the block could be configured and the permeability between each moment. Nevertheless, in order of this uh, till now, uh, layers of uh, public spaces, green and, and housing, we needed some elements that we borrow from OMA when uh, OMA designed the La Villette in Paris that he called his confetti. And we imagine a series of uh, uh, exceptional moments that can activate the grid for their uh, alien functional uh, presence, such as uh, cults, cinema, discotheques, etc., etc. And this is the master plan in his uh, totality. As you can see, uh, the blocks we design and the function we design, they blend. There's not a direction. The, this uh, the extension of the grids uh, aims to this sort of a natural blending between, uh, let's say, the back part of the city and the other part. As you can see, um, the typology itself we accepted as necessary. Now. And somehow, um, again, it, it's we wanted to celebrate as a not to forget uh, the, this, the place around the silos, the silos where the explosion happened, where as a big moment of community, maybe a great plaza. Um, in general, what I think it's as I was saying at the beginning uh, to conclude a bit. Um, this project and all the presentation, uh, we really wanted to create uh, it, as much as we could a space that uh, we could have reappropriate uh, the cities and could have reappropriate the city of Beirut through a diverse uh, investments, through a diverse type of spaces. As you can see in this image, there is a just exposition of programs that I think are really vital for a city to be more equal, to be more uh, alive. And somehow this quality of uh, these sudden programs that coexist together, it's something that we always try to make happen in our project. And somehow we would like to be more uh, surprised to see uh, how then uh, these genetic spaces could uh, be inhabited in the future uh, with new te technologies and new generations. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening to us. And of course, even though we don't have a lot of time, we are more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, yeah, for first of all, uh, thank you. Really, thank you. And we are really kind of positively surprised because I think we didn't expect, and we've been just messaging to each other on WhatsApp that I, we think that it's one of our greatest talks that we actually had uh, because for, for the last uh, three, four months, we've been slowly kind of transitioning to the idea of events of more, of more critical thinking, let's say, and more of the kind of research-based uh, projects. And this is what you do in, in contrast to, for example, commercial big uh, architects, yeah? Um, and, that, and this is what I love, especially in terms of architecture as, uh, as well, that you focus a lot on the research and this research is shown in your projects and that flows um, 
and it's also kind of transitioned to the final resolution. Yeah? And this is what really surprised me positively, and I'm really happy about this. Um, and kind of the first question, if I don't mind, of course, the other uh, people feel free to ask them, uh, write in the chat or just join the conversation, is in, when you look at the generic space and at the kind of most or statement that you created when doing the practice, uh, was it kind of a goal that this is what you want to do? This is what uh, you want to focus your projects on? Do you understand my question? Yes, yes. Miki, you want to answer? Yes, actually, you are very perceptive because no, the answer <laughs> is, is not. Uh, at a certain point, we, we just recognized that we were always going to uh, some kind of architecture. We were interested to some kind of architecture that had some features that were uh, always coming back and coming back. And actually, you're perfectly right. Like this kind of, uh, of uh, also this kind of presentation is not the first time we talk about the topic, but uh, we, let's say half of the project uh, were, were done way before uh, thinking or, or, uh, or focusing specifically on that. And uh, yes. So, okay. And uh, that leads me to another question is, do you think that generally the practices should, should be working like this maybe? That the, what we talked, what we started talking at the beginning in terms of this local offices, yeah? Uh, maybe they, each of them should focus on different typology, let's say. Just a question for debate maybe. If I can answer this question, um, I do believe so I think we are in, in a moment that is a bit critical, as I was saying in the beginning, um, especially for us, that happens to all of us and living in different situations and economic situation and cultural situation. Architecture is a privilege for a lot of, uh, for a few people in right now. And that's why we start questioning who can, has access to architecture. There's a, till a certain extension that architecture is, matters until a certain architecture that in certain reality doesn't matter anymore, right? You can see the beauty and the happiness of uh, uh, the elemental houses or uh, no, that mm -hmm. they give, the architects accept to give like a rough shell and then uh, each person wants to express themselves or because they cannot afford to have uh, a type architect, no? Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, uh, I live in a country, as, as you know, where architecture is never, in, the market is never in crisis. In Japan, everything is destroyed every 30 years is the general lifetime, average lifetime. So it's always building and constructing, building and constructing. Although the quality of the building, uh, it's not that much high as it should be in a market that is not in crisis, because I, I think, um, let's say the access to, um, let's say service of architecture, it should be a, a little bit more accessible. And therefore, um, I think young architects in, in general, they have just the chance to think about what matters. So then- That's a really good point. Right, then, <laughs> Of course, it got diluted. In, there is amazing established firms and architects that they they think about uh, the city in a certain extensions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But still, I think yes, I think we should have a more ethic approach and uh, or ethical approach. And I think this is what me and Michele we always uh, somehow got driven to is uh, we we had a really. We had a really great education in terms of architecture. I think we had one of the best architects in the world teaching us how a space should be and et cetera, et cetera. So I think is we need to bring that quality to everybody. That's a bit what we, I, you know, how I can answer, you can feel to answer. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the definitely answer, answer my question. And 
uh, I, I wrote just for for myself when we when you were presenting that uh, a thought that the big architects are doing opposite what you just said. I, I think kind of the, the biggest ones. Yeah, big, uh, they and I and I just want to say that the big architects built for rich, and the young architects built for poor. Well, uh, Miki, then you can also add for sure your, your point of view indeed. Uh, no, I don't think it's necessarily like that. Uh, it should not be like that, first of all. Second of all, I think there is a really great architects that are working for uh, meaning uh, huge uh, topics, really challenging topics. Uh, I don't want to name anybody, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's a matter of... Uh, I think again. I, I don't want to point it. We don't want to point a finger. We're just saying that uh, um, we think that architecture should be a more like a more service re rewarded. Of course, um, that would can like for example. Let me let me do just one example that I think it's important for us. Like Antonio Vassal is an office that uh, is doing this really well and uh, is one of the most deserved Pritzker Prize. And they always, doesn't matter if the client is uh, rich or not. I think it, there is a really uh, responsible uh, uh, attitude towards the problems, right? Um, so I think this is what we, what I think we should have an example. And in our case, we would like, again, to create some architecture that they can be inhabited by everybody uh, without any to be when we say inclusive it's really simple like it's, it's a space of a connection or it's a bit uh, it's a canvas that people will will inhabit we are more than happy that uh, the buildings we built are changed or live yeah this is what we said at the beginning this open infrastructure and inclusive uh, inclusivity inclusivity yeah and this is also kind of amazing that you follow all of these ideas that you I, I think that you set up at the beginning yes this and that you go with this because you know how the young minds especially change uh, they thoughts change every week mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why it's also interesting to see um, I don't, I, any does someone have a question um yeah um I was wondering actually where are you looking for inspiration mm -hmm. and I've noticed that some of your works are linked to the Greek mythology some of their names that is yeah that that, that was a really interesting thing for me mm -hmm. where did you link that mm -hmm. how did you find the connection between it and uh, how did you find that almost metaphysical style for your renderings and how did it all came together like that as a result? I answer me here or you answer? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, the metaphy, uh, well, let's start from, you asked me a lot of things interesting. So there is a bit of a nostalgia in this because uh, we, mm, me and Michele, we, we studied, as I was saying, together most of our life. And in high school, especially, we did the classical studies in Italy. So we learned ancient Greek. Um, and we thought that it was easy for us at the beginning to try to summarize our ideas as a slogan to the, the main act of the project uh, through a, a word that it was easier for us to, to summarize with that is a really simple as this. Um, but this is important because I think as we're doing this uh, vis visual research and research of thematics through an image, let's say, um, that is natural. And I think we are, te our tendency is to be extremely rational in dealing with the problem. I mean, at the end, to have a really clear idea of what is the specific intervention we need to do in that space. And if you can summarize it with the word, it's really, it means that you're dominating the, the act of architecture in this case. 
the images are um, in general the images are uh, a, a process of uh, fun the representation one but the most important i think is the is the one we presented at the beginning because if i i can also talk about the project just with that technically all right uh thank you very much for your response and unfortunately i should leave earlier so i have to go and i would like to thank you for accepting our invitation and for being our guest speakers for today and you have a huge contribution to what what we wanted to do and this is amazing simply amazing so yes thank you so much i have to leave so yeah good night we'll, we'll stay <laughs> Thank you, Rina. Thank you for coordinating everything. Thank My you. pleasure. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Um, okay. And uh, about the about Japan because that that was really interesting. That dance here, yeah? this idea I, I've never heard about this before. And when you presented uh, kind of the plan of uh, one of these uh, social housing ports uh, came to my mind was especially New York yeah, and the social housing over there. Um, and what you did is kind of a little bit uh, similar to the idea, I, I think. Uh, no, you might have done it before, before actually, uh, of the Prisca winners 2020. I don't want to say the names now, but I think you remember with the extended balconies. No, no, it's Lakatona Vassal. We, 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 I mentioned it already before. No, yes, yeah. indeed, they are, they are a huge inspiration for us. Okay, okay. No, and I think, you know, uh, the housing in New York inhabits over 500,000 uh, people. Uh, and this is a, a majority of uh, the society, especially in New York. And your idea could kind of bring this public elements even more uh, over there. And this is what uh, kind of inspires me, I, I think. Uh, because you add a language that could be repeated, not only in the particular situation. I know, of course, it depends on the context, etc. However, your language that seems to be localized can be also universal. Would you agree with some of the solution solutions? Well, um, that's a really good question, actually. Let me tell you one thing. There is a, we are living in a global market. Therefore, a lot of uh, approach, I think, we can just learn from the others. For example, in the case of Lakatone Vassal, I don't think what we like is the polycarbonate or the curtains shading. Or I think it's what if we found. I think maybe, Mickey, I don't know if you want to you're not agreeing with me, but what I found really strong, it's uh, the beginning, it was the idea that they stated that is, it was cheaper to keep the building and restore it and refurbish it and extending the quality. So it's a sequence that rather than demolish it, right? It's a sequence of a mastering something else than architecture. That's, I think it's also the importance here. It's not about the design. It's about how wider are your interest, uh, you know, how wide is your knowledge? Um, then mm, sure, like when, again, then coming back to the, let's say, localizing the, the architectural approach. We, uh, I think it's important to support local uh, realities, local artisanal, et cetera, et cetera. Although uh, in a project such as, uh, immediate uh, like the one in uh, Cabane for example or the one in Milano the polycarbonate maybe they will be different right one will be the Japanese version the other one will be the Italian hopefully the curtains as well right yes, but I, I, actually the point is the polycarbonate I mean is there because it's uh, it's it's also in terms of communication uh, I mean the project we 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 showed like a couple of them are purely theoretically. So since Lakaton Vassal or other people much more famous than us or much more influential than will ever be, uh, use it, you associate already with, with one 
we what we want to to, to have there. But uh, I mean, the point is to be sustainable. But I'm not I'm not th- talking about like to be green or whatever, but to sustainable in in the sense that they use it because in that case is the cheapest material is the lighter material is what what uh, in in a, in a work site you can move better and blah blah so of course in kobane it will be one material i mean maybe maybe it will be the same maybe not but uh, yes like uh, this kind of project of ours are really mm, more about the the, 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 the idea the, the idea uh, and the st- yeah exactly more than the strategy the strategy be- beyond okay so yeah. this idea is kind of what brings you into the global language Maybe, uh, do you want th- this idea to be universal instead of the kind of solution Sorry. Oh, I think I think that uh, what we're trying to say is uh, that the the action they react to a global market. So the strategy are global. That's why you associate it to a project that is uh, is a global. You, mm-hmm. you also remember is global somehow. Then when you're gonna be built, uh, that's another completely another discussion, right? Since our project they stop at this level for now, the one we show today, right? Then of course the one maybe we're building are a different uh, relationship but it, when you will deal with the locality you will have the cheapest solution affordable for that market yeah. that i yeah. think is a thing that it, it will generate for example will... the, the one in uh, in brazil buritis in belo horizonte that one was local and was uh, i mean we did the research on what was the cheapest material to 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 rent and was the scaffolding mm-hmm. but uh, but because in in that in that case we had to build it actually exactly. but uh, um, let me think i don't know in other projects it's i mean you know like we know our reality so maybe i know i know the construction, um, the construction system in, in Italy, in Switzerland, in Portugal, where we have been living in in, in Japan for Andrea. But uh, if we do a project in Congo, once mm-hmm. you you bring it to 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 the work to the work site level, you understand it. Mm. Okay. With that principle, of course. Mm-hmm. And also, from what I know, it's kind of the inter- interesting and important aspects for you is that, and it also resembles the idea that recently I, I read uh, by Daniel Arsham. I don't know if you, uh, yeah, an artist, the artist, yeah. the, the artist exactly, and he he posted on Instagram or something like that young architects should not uh, focus on buildings but not buildings. Uh, and this is what you kind of show for now, of course, because uh, you are emerging practice. Yeah. Uh, when did when did your origi- uh, origin, like your practice? When did you begin? Out of curiosity. 2000. At the end of 2016, I think. Yes. Okay. So emerging practice, of course. Yeah. Um, and that the social events or generally the social aspects of this creates your architecture in, in some way. The, this is how I perceive it. I don't know if you agree with me. That the events, this performance, as you said, uh, is what is architecture in your projects. Do you agree? If you understand me. <laughs> Miki, you want to answer? I lost you, I'm sorry. I totally lost you. Hello? Can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Do you want me to? Yes, I can. Okay. Now. Can you summarize? Sorry, one in two words the question then. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so, um, in from what I notice is that these social activities, this performance, uh, as you mentioned, is what creates architecture in your projects. And do you agree with this? 
in all the projects it should be, no? I would answer that. I mean, in a certain, yeah, in a certain level, in all the project, in the sense that we are trying to create to creating generic spaces. So the, the space and the architecture is important as well. The users and what they do with the space is very important. So it's, that's exactly the, the, the thin line I was talking about in the beginning about like, mm, it's not only about the designer. Exactly. So, so my answer is yes, but in the end of the day, my opinion is that uh, whatever project is, I mean, it depends on how people use it. But the, if I can add something, it's important that the quality itself of the project should stimulate the people to use it beyond their expectations and beyond your expectations yeah, as exactly. creator. So I think this is uh, that's I think it's uh, is the ultimate goal for us. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> A satisfactory answer. <laughs> okay, thank uh, you. Any other questions, Hida, or anyone from the audience? Um, yeah, I just wanted to open it up to the audience. Do you have any questions? We'd love to hear your voices and what you think. Yeah, we'll check on YouTube. From my side, the, the, there could be more questions, but I don't want to raise them, <laughs> I, I think, anymore. Uh, <laughs> because we could talk about each, each of your projects, really. I, I'd love to spend some time on this. And I really um, asked you for, you know, putting the descriptions to, of these projects to the internet, because this is what I was really missing, if you don't mind. No, we will. We will. Uh... <clears throat> Again, this is, was a bit latest production. Uh, we concentrate a bit more lately on on production than than itself to the releasing indeed um, but yes i think again for us it was a great pleasure to be able to share with you our uh till now <laughs> research and point of view uh, is in continuous evolution that's i think it's the important thing that also to answer your question before uh, yeah, so thank you again, uh, everybody. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Haida. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much for coming. Bye. Bye. It's a great, uh, great pleasure to end. We'll try to promote it as much as possible. As we said, we really love this talk and we want to kind of spread. Uh, we don't have so many followers, but we got them. So, you know, any new audience, uh, sure. uh, I think, will be useful. So okay. thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>